Good morning and Merry Christmas from the Grace Church and the Grace Message. So glad that you have joined us this morning. Just a reminder as we get started together, remember this is that time when people think about their year-end giving and support of nonprofits and churches. Remember the Grace Church in your year-end giving. We can't do what we do without you, and we're so excited to have you on board with us. Go to our website at thegracechurch.org and make sure you designate your gift using that drop-down menu. Remember, if you want to bless the church in Lubbock, well, choose Lubbock. And if you want to bless the church campus in Dallas, then choose Dallas. And of course, if you're joining us online, we consider you to be part of our online campus and you can give your gift to support the online ministry of the Grace Church as well. All right, with that, why don't we open with a word of prayer together. Father, we thank you for this time. We just ask that you would minister to us in a powerful way today by your word and by your spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, it is Christmas and it's time to celebrate Jesus, right? Well, we've already this past week been talking about the humanity of Jesus, his compatibility with our humanity, him being fully divine and yet fully human. Wow, the gift of Jesus at Christmas is something to contemplate. And with that in mind, we're going to dive into John chapter 1. I've titled this message, Light in the Darkness, the Miracle of Christmas. We begin in John chapter 1, verse 1. John writes and he says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. All right, so first we're seeing the divinity of Jesus. In the beginning, Jesus was. He didn't show up 2,000 years ago. He's always lived. He's always existed. In the beginning was the Word. We talk about the Word like it's the Bible, and that's fine and good, but remember the Word is really Jesus. The living Word is Jesus Christ. We might experience truth about Him through the written Word, but Jesus is the living, eternal, word that has always existed. In the beginning, he was with God and he was God from the very beginning. So we've got the divinity of Christ front and center here on Christmas to celebrate all that Jesus is to us. Now in verse two, John writes, he was in the beginning with God. All things came into being Through him and apart from him, nothing came into being that has come into being. Jesus as creator. I mean, growing up, I used to think of the Father as the creator. And there's nothing wrong with that. That's true. I used to think maybe of the Spirit as the creator. You know, the Holy Spirit moving over the surface of the waters back in Genesis Well, all of that is true. The Father was involved in creation and the Spirit was involved. But here we see that Jesus is the Creator God. And so when we realize that, then we start saying, well, if He's my designer, then maybe I better listen to Him and His message to understand my design, to understand how I work, to understand what really fulfills me and makes me content. He's my designer. He's got a lot to say about the design. And so John writes this and he says, nothing came into being apart from him. So we're not here by accident. Some people will try to tell you that it was random chance. We're here by accident. Well, you've got a real big origins problem on your hands, don't you? Because how do you get a living cell from a non-living cell? And then how do you get a non-living cell to begin with? It can't pop out of nowhere. I mean, everything we know about science tells us that matter has to come from someplace. So we're not here by random accident or chance It says right here in John chapter 1 that everything that came into being is here because Jesus Christ made it. So 
make no mistake, some people debate, did Jesus claim to be God? Did he really say that about himself? Or was he just a prophet or a good teacher? Maybe his resume was colored later, you know, changed, edited, uh, and uh, made to look better than it really was later. What we're seeing in John's gospel is that John and Jesus are testifying to his divinity. Before Abraham, I am. Jesus is claiming to be eternal. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Jesus is claiming to be one with the Father and God himself. And so it's pretty clear in the New Testament, the man, Jesus Christ, is also the only begotten from the Father who was in the beginning. Jesus is fully man, but he's fully God. So we got a whole lot to celebrate about that manger and that Bethlehem story and that birth because here is God incarnate showing himself to us, relating to us, and he is eventually through his life, death, resurrection, he's going to show us what real love is looks like. Real love looks like the cross and the resurrection. Now, in verse 4, he says, in him was life, and the life was the light of men. Think about a light bulb that does not function without electricity. Think about a car that doesn't function without gas. Think about a jet engine that doesn't function without that jet fuel. See, it says here, Jesus is the light of men. And so what we're reading is that he's designed to inhabit us and shine through us and live through us. And, you know, man was never meant to be an empty shell of a person trying to cope and make life work. And yet that seems to be what the world thinks, that, you know, you got strong people and weak people, you got capable people, people with this trait and this personality and this characteristic, and so they're trying to beef up the shell. But the gospel says it's not about the shell, it's about what the shell contains. We have this treasure in earthen vessels so that the power and the glory is of God and it's not of ourselves. So you can dress up the shell just like you can dress up that car. You can give it a new paint job, you can wash it and wax it and make it look shiny, but if it doesn't have gasoline, it's not going to function the way intended. It's intended to be. I mean, you could... You could put that through the car wash a thousand times, and yet it won't run the way it was designed. Just like that jet, it won't function without the fuel. Just like that light bulb, it won't function properly. It looks pretty. It looks interesting. Neat shape to it. Some interesting stuff going on on the inside, but it's not functioning the way it was designed until it has light in it and through it. And that's what John is saying about humanity. You and I were meant, were designed to display the life of Jesus Christ. His life is our light. Now, he says in verse 5, The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. Well, no joke. Have you read the Gospels lately? Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John? I mean, first of all, they don't understand who Jesus is. Second of all, when they think they do understand who he is, they try to kill him, they hate him, they torture him, and mock him, and disrespect him, and kill him. So the darkness didn't seem to want the light. They didn't comprehend the light, at least, and many of them didn't want the light. And that's still the case today. We got acceptors and rejectors of Christ. But I I want you to think about the feelings of God for a minute. We don't do this very often, but we'll put ourselves in the emotions and feelings of God for a second. Imagine being rejected by your own creation. I mean, imagine you as light wanting nothing but good for a group of people. You've got good motives, good rationale, a good purpose, and everything you do is good, and they just won't see it. I mean, they just malign you and denigrate you and belittle you and ultimately reject and kill you. Now, that's what God felt. I mean, Jesus is God, and that's what Jesus felt. So, Why did he go through all of this to become human, to be a baby? He could have 
gotten all kinds of illnesses and sicknesses. He could have died at a young age. I mean, anything could have happened to that baby Jesus when you think about it. But God had a plan. Jesus was really human and frail and fragile and susceptible to anything. But God had a plan. And Jesus did this. The the frailty, the weakness, the mocking, the scourging, the disrespect, the death, the resurrection, everything fading to black before that, not knowing, you know, my God, my God, why? Why have you forsaken me? He did it for you. That's the gift. The gift of Christmas is not just some neat story about baby Jesus in a manger. That Man God grows up to be life to you. He grows up and gives his life for you. And then he gives his life to you. And then he lives his life through you. And his life in you is the light of men. And he makes us the light of the world. We contain that light. We have that light in earthen vessels. So the gift of Christmas is more than a sweet story about a baby. It's about God becoming flesh and inhabiting us, ultimately saying, I'm compatible with you people. And so now I'm going to inhabit you people so that you come alive and possess the light that you were designed to possess. Now, verse 6, he says, There came a man sent from God whose name was John. Talking about John the Baptist. He came as a witness to testify about the light so that all might believe through him. All right, John the Baptist. You know the story. He was perceived perhaps by some as a lunatic. I mean, he was a prophet. And of all those born of women, Jesus says John the Baptist was the greatest. In the kingdom of God, though, in the kingdom of God, there's you and me. And Jesus says that we are greater than John the Baptist. How could that be? What does he mean greater? Well, there's a long line of Old Testament people. And this is going to come up again as this message concludes a little later. But there was a long line of people in the Old Testament who were prophets. Many of them, they were living under the law. They had the best that the Old Testament had to offer. Now, what uh, what Jesus is saying is John the Baptist is the last. He's the last of that type of person from the Old Testament. But now you are a different type. You're a new creation. You're from the New Testament. You're a new covenant believer. So you're a new type of person. John the Baptist was the greatest of the old type. But now, because there's a new type, even the least in the kingdom of God is greater than John the Baptist. You say, what what does that mean? Well, think about everything you've got. Think about everything the disciples were waiting on. Think about Pentecost and everything that it meant. New heart, new spirit, God's spirit living in you, union with Christ. Nobody really had it like that before. Remember in the Old Testament, David and Samson and others, they're they're worried about losing the spirit. You don't have to worry about losing the spirit. Why not? Because you've got something greater, greater than John the Baptist ever experienced. So John comes on the scene and he is announcing, he's a witness who is announcing, testifying to the light. He's talking about Jesus. Why? So that all can believe and receive him. That's the goal. So the Bible is not really a book of morality and ethics. The Bible is about Jesus. It's about believing in Jesus. And when we believe, we receive. We become children of God. So the message is not try to imitate John the Baptist. The message is not try to imitate Jesus. The message is not turn over a new leaf in the new year and try your hardest. (laughs) No, the message is actually one of faith. Just trust him. Don't try, trust. Don't try to achieve, just receive. It's all about what you believe. What you believe matters. And so as we continue the passage, we see in verse 8, John the Baptist was not the light, 
but he came to testify about the light. So John wasn't the light. John wasn't Jesus. And also John's message was not the gospel. Do you know that? John the Baptist, his message was not the gospel. He had a message, but it was not the message. John the Baptist's message was basically, stop your sinning, repent. And by the way, psst, somebody's coming soon that's better than me. That's John the Baptist's message. Stop your sinning and somebody's coming. Now, that's not enough to save. So if you ever wondered why it is that the apostles, Peter, James, John, Paul, running around in the book of Acts, for example, and they're saying, have you received the Spirit yet? And some of these uh, uh, people are saying, well, um, you know, I, I didn't even know there was a Holy Spirit. <laughs> I, I didn't even realize there was more to the message. And then the apostles say, well, then what have you been believing? And they say, well, I mean, we heard about John the Baptist, and, and, and we heard about repentance from sins, uh, and, uh, you know, that's kind of it. And then the apostles, what would they do? They would get them up to speed. They'd say, that's not it. That's not enough. That doesn't cause you to have the light. That won't give you life. That's just repentance from sins and the announcement that Jesus is coming. But let me tell you, Jesus has come. And he is the light of the world, and he gives us life. He's jet fuel for your, for your engine. He's gas for your car. He's electricity for your bulb. What, what is being said here is that John was not your hope, and Jesus is your hope. And, and it's not about just behavior reform and repentance. It's about faith in Christ. And by faith, we get everything we need. Everything is for free by faith. Now, he says in verse 9, There was the true light which coming into the world enlightens every man. All right, what does that tell you? Every single person is designed to receive Christ. Have we received him yet? Because, you know, candidly, there are people teaching false stuff, falsehoods, lies, that the whole world is saved, or that the whole world is in Christ, or maybe you would say here, the whole world has been enlightened and given, they've been given the light of the world. And that's not, not the case. That is not the case. Because we see Paul, for example, in the New Testament, he talks about two people that were in Christ before him. Okay, do you hear that? They were in Christ before him. So when did Paul become in Christ? Well, he wasn't born that way. Uh, he became in Christ after that road to Damascus, after that encounter with Jesus. He believed and received and had Christ living in him at that point. But there were other people who got saved before Paul. So that shows you everybody is born without Jesus, and then we receive Christ at a certain point in time. So anybody that's teaching that the whole world is in Christ, they just don't realize it, well, they don't know what they're talking about, and they're falling at the feet of knowledge. They're saying, well, it's just knowledge. You just got to know that you've already got him. He's already in there. You just got to know. Well, that's true for a believer, but not for an unbeliever. And so we're going to see this in this passage as we continue. Here's verse 10. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, and the world did not know him. You remember Matthew? Depart from me, I never knew you. Well, this is another way to say it. The world didn't know Jesus. Jesus didn't know him. And in the end... Those who don't have him, those who don't have light and life, he's going to say, depart from me. I didn't know you, and you didn't know me. So clearly there are unbelievers and believers. But look at the beauty of this passage. It says he was in the world, and the world was made through him. He's the designer, the creator, the architect, the builder. He does it all. And then his own creation his own construction site, and everybody in it rejects him. Now, 
Verse 11, he came to his own and those who were his own did not receive him. So what does that tell you? Is there a natural inborn state of the world wanting Jesus? No. Adam and Eve started it all. They said, no, thank you, sir. They draw a ring around themselves and they say, I'm Lord of this ring. No, thank you. I don't need your light and I don't need your life. Now, what are we celebrating here at Christmas as believers? We've said, yes, give me the light and give me the life. And that is what you have. It's not a behavior improvement program. It's not some religion of try harder and be better. You've got the light and you've got the life. And that's the true gift of Christmas. Jesus himself in you and me. Verse 12, but as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become. Notice they have to become children of God, even to those who believe in his name. All right, so how do you become a child of God? First of all, you don't start out one. Uh, There are people out there saying, well, we're all children of God. False, false, false. There's something special about being in Christ. We're not all born as children of God. It says here, you got to have that right to be called children of God. And how does it happen? Well, notice it's not rejecting, it's receiving. And notice that it's really easy. I mean, people are throwing stones at easy believism. Well, that is exactly what this passage says. It is definitely, as Jesus says, easy and light. And it is definitely believism because you see it right here. I mean, right here in this verse, in verse 12, it says, even to those who believe in his name. Now, Does that mean you got to be a master theologian? Does that mean you got to be a Bible study leader? You got to be a priest, a pastor, a a deacon, an elder? You got to be somebody with a position? No. What is he saying? Even if you believe in his name, I trust the name of Jesus. I know who he is, what he stands for, what he did, and I trust in him. It's that simple. It's easy, and it's believism. And that's why people miss it. They say, it's not believism, it's baptism. And the gospel says, it's not baptism, it's believism. (laughs) They say, it's not believism, it's obedience. Well, if you want to say it's obedience, it's the obedience of faith. Believing is obeying. When you believe the gospel, you obey the gospel. So we've got something to celebrate. Those of us who've entered into Christ, we've become children of God, we've received him, and now we understand the greatest gift of Christmas. It's not a day of packages to open. It's not a story about a good teacher being born and some shepherds and wise men adoring him. It's about you and literally your body being infused with a God who announced himself as one of us and announced himself as the fuel for our engine. Christ in you, your only hope of glory. Verse 13, these children of God were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. All right, what does that mean? Well, remember who he's talking to primarily, the Jews, and they think, well, I'm a child of God just because I'm a Jewish person. I'm a child of God because I'm from the tribe of Levi or Judah or whatever. They think they're a child of God just because of their blood, because mom and dad are the ones that conceived them, and mom and dad are Israelites. Therefore, I'm a child of God just like my ancestors. And John is saying it doesn't work that way, folks. It's not about the will of man or the will of woman. It's not about the will of the flesh. It's not about your birthright physically. It's not about your heritage, your lineage, your country of origin. It's about being born of God. Now, right there is a truth that's worth talking about for hours. I mean, seriously, you... Picture yourself 
born of God. Your DNA, your spiritual makeup, everything that you call you is of God. Now, how are you going to believe that and then say, I've got a sinful nature? How are you going to believe that and then say, I've got a wicked heart? How are you going to say that and then say, well, I'm not right with God? Look at you, new heart, new spirit, God's spirit in you, obedient from the heart, righteous, the righteousness of God, because you're born of God. So this phrase, born of God, is just power packed. It is giving us the why of our identity. Some people think the why of their identity is God chose to look at us differently. No, God didn't just choose to look at you differently. He's not faking himself out. He's not tricking himself. He's not looking through Jesus' glasses. He doesn't have a special telescope to focus in on your good side. What we're saying is that you're actually good because God is good and you're born of God. So you have a good heart, a good nature, a new heart, a new nature. You are born of God's spirit. Now, that's something to celebrate when we really get our new identity, when we really take hold of what it means to be a child of God, not just in some sort of way that God looks at us, faking himself out, but to realize we've actually got the DNA, the spiritual genetics. Now, that is incredible. Verse 14, and Jesus, the word, became flesh and dwelt among us, And we saw his glory, glory as of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. Wow, the only begotten from the Father. Oh my goodness, are you kidding me? I mean, now we've got it. The uniqueness of Jesus. God never did this before. He's never going to do it again. It's a one time and one time only. The word becomes flesh. Mary's involved, but she didn't initiate this. Mary's involved, but there's no sin passed down. Mary's a sinner. Make no mistake, Mary's not perfect. She's a sinner. And yet, through Mary, Mary's able to participate, and yet God is born born without sin, tempted in every way, and yet his nature and his heart just overcome everything so that he never sins a day in his life. And then when he inhabits us, he knows what it's like. You think he doesn't know what it's like to be tempted with lust, to be tempted with bitterness or resentment, to be tempted to prove himself to another group or get revenge? He got all those thoughts but he didn't give in to any of them. And that's the whole point. So that he could understand, not just empathize with our humanity, but actually be power for us. Power over sin and death. Jesus is our power. The power is a person. We're not preaching words here. We're preaching life, his life. The Bible, the gospel, is not just a bunch of beliefs like a belief system. The gospel is Christ in you and everything that entails. That's the gift of Christmas, Christ in you. Verse 15, John testified about him and cried out saying, This was he of whom I said, he who comes after me, he has a higher rank than I, for he existed before me. As I said earlier, that's it. That's all John the Baptist has to say. I mean, it's great if you like John the Baptist, but let me tell you, his ministry was limited. He says, I must decrease so that Jesus can increase. John's not hating himself there. He's just saying, my ministry is fading, and here comes the ministry of Christ. Now, as he continues, he says, for his, of his fullness... We have all received and grace upon grace. Oh my goodness, I love this verse. I mean, this verse is one of those rare ones. You could skip over it. You could gloss over it, not think much about it. You could go a year or two or three and not consider it. But just slow down with me. Slow down enough to consider what this is really saying. 
I mean, it says, of his fullness, the fullness of Jesus, the completeness of Christ, of his fullness, we have all received. Do you hear that? So it's not special treatment. It's not for the pastors or the bishops or the cardinals or the, the, the elders or the deacons or the volunteers or the, you know, the whatever. It's not for any special group. It's for all children of God, of his completeness, of his fullness, of his nature, we have all received. And then, how much grace is there? How much grace is there, Grace Church? How much grace is there? Well, it's grace upon grace upon grace upon grace upon grace. So look at it. We've received his fullness and there's grace everywhere. Now, doesn't that sum up the gospel? We've received his fullness and there's grace upon grace. Gotta love it. That is the core message of the gospel. Verse 17, the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth were realized through Jesus Christ. So when does the new start? The new doesn't start with John the Baptist. John's point is that the new doesn't start there. The new starts with Jesus, with the cross, with the resurrection, with Pentecost. Everything starts with Jesus. His death is the dividing line of human history. And we live on this side of the cross and that changes everything. The law came in through Moses. Jesus is not ministering the law to you today. That was Moses. Jesus brings in grace and truth. Now, does he mention the law? Of course he does. A few choice times, Jesus really drives home the law, right? Cut off your hand, pluck out your eye, be perfect. You think it's enough to avoid murder? I say anger is murder. You think avoiding lust is good enough, sir? No. I'll tell you what, if you look, if you look with lust, it's the same as adultery. So do you see it? He's mentioning the law, raising the bar. Why? So that grace and truth can come in through him, through his death and his resurrection. And that's what we have today. We're not under the ministry of Moses. We're under the beautiful ministry of Jesus. Now, we're going to finish with verse 18. No one has seen God at any time. The only begotten God who is in the bosom of the Father, he has explained him. Now, if you ever wondered, is Jesus saying he's God? Look at what John is saying, the only begotten God. He doesn't leave room here for son of God, son of man. No, in this verse, while all those things are true, in this verse, what he's saying is the only begotten God. Do you hear that? What other God has been born like this? No other. You know, world religions would say God would never stoop so low. But that's exactly what our God did. In incredible humility, he stooped so low to become one of us, the only begotten God. And you want to understand God? Look to Jesus. This verse, verse 18, it says, Jesus has explained God. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. I and the Father are one. Have I been with you all this time? How can you say, show us the Father? I've been with you, Jesus says. You want to understand the heart of God this Christmas? You want to understand the passion of our God who pursued us and saved us and indwelt us and forgave us and gave us grace upon grace upon grace? Don't look up to heaven as if you're making a long distance phone call trying to figure out who God is. Fix your eyes on Jesus. Jesus has fully explained our God. Merry Christmas, everyone. Let's have a word of prayer together. Father, we thank you for Christmas. It's a fun time. It could be celebrated any time of the year, 
but we're celebrating Jesus incarnate, Jesus becoming one of us, born fully human and fully God. And what we want to take away from this today, Father, is that you are so compatible with us. You are fuel for our engine, light for our light bulb, gasoline for the car. You're everything we need of your fullness we have received. We are complete in you. Jesus is our life and Jesus is our light. We trust him. We thank him. We are so grateful. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Merry Christmas, everyone.